Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms in the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all the tempting, he left him until an opportune time. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. This is the last in our month-long series on Strong and Weak. If this is your first Sunday to be joining us during the series, um, I'm going to try to give a recap of the whole series to catch you up. But if you uh, find yourself after today wishing you, uh, I'd slowed down and uh, unpacked a little more, you can go back and, and watch the pod, listen to the podcast or watch the live stream uh, archives on our service. Or you can pick up the book, Strong and Weak by Andy Crouch, on which this series is based. If you have been here all month, you've probably heard the words authority and vulnerability more than you ever wanted to in your life. Uh, We've been talking about authority and vulnerability. Authority as the capacity that God gives all of us to take meaningful action. And vulnerability is the risk every single one of us has to face. And so in your bulletin today, you have a little card that says authority and vulnerability. And as I go through the message today, my hope is, is that you might just be asking God, you know, the question that's on this page, authority, what will you do? What is God calling you to do? Because God has given authority to every single one of us, some place in the world where we can take meaningful action to make the world a better place. But when we take meaningful action, it often puts something at risk. It costs us something. And so on the flip side, vulnerability, what will you risk? Are you willing to share a vulnerability of someone else? Are you willing to take action? And what will it cost you to do that? I I fully believe that it's not just coming and listening to the word, but it's when we put into action. And I hope God has been calling you, whispering to you, to, to do something, to risk something as a result of the messages you've been hearing. So keep that in mind as I go through my message today. Uh, quick, as I said, I'm going to do a quick recap. Uh, authority, we've all received authority. It's part of what, how God made human beings. And God calls every single one of us to use our influence, our gifts, our position, our, our, even our relationships to, to act with authority and make the world a better place. But God also gives us vulnerabilities. And we tend to hide our vulnerabilities, every single one, one of us, because those are sensitive spots. And yet our vulnerabilities are also gifts because it's through our vulnerabilities that we connect to other people. It's without vulnerabilities, there would be no relationships between people. We, we wouldn't need each other. And so what we're called to do is create relationships in communities where authority and vulnerability are shared Because when authority and vulnerability are shared together, that's when people flourish. And that's the goal we're going towards always, is for us to flourish. 
And so we put those concepts on a graph, authority on one axis and vulnerability on the other, and we went through different biblical stories that help illustrate what this looks like. We started with Samson, who at the beginning was all strength and authority, but had no vulnerability, and therefore he wasn't really fully developed as a human being. It's, it was in his weakness that something grew in him, and that taught us that in our weaknesses, something grows in us. And then the next week, we looked at Adam and Eve. We looked at how Adam and Eve tried to reach for authority to cover up their vulnerability so that they would become like God. And that gave us a glimpse into the path of idolatry, that every time we try to take a, a shortcut to power, we end up in the quadrant of suffering. And then the next week, we looked at Esther. And Esther was someone who was called to take a risk on behalf of her people, but at the beginning, she was scared to do so because if she went into the king's presence without being called, she could be killed. She was tempted, as all of us are tempted, sometimes to, to hide our true selves, to wrap ourselves in bubble wrap. But bubble wrap may keep us safe, but it keeps us from becoming who God calls us to be. And then lastly, last week we talked about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a, as someone who exploited others, who, who used his power and authority to cover up the fact that he was a wee little man, his vulnerability. And yet, Zacchaeus also gave us the call that we all have to repent, and we have to use our authority in order to work for justice, equality, and inclusion of all people. So that's kind of where we've gone, and today that brings us back to flourishing. And today we want to discover uh, the story of Jesus. And I've said throughout this series that, that Jesus represents the, the pinnacle of a human authority and human vulnerability, that, that Jesus gives us our best picture of authority and vulnerability combined. But Jesus was tempted, just as we're all tempted, to make a false choice, to use his authority to cover up his vulnerability, and, and to make the choice, you know, as opposed to Adam and Eve. And, 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 and we see these temptation narratives uh, in, in, in both Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. It, the story begins actually not with a temptation, but with Jesus being baptized. When he's baptized by his cousin John, the heavens open above him and a dove descends and a voice calls out from heaven and tells Jesus, this is my son, my beloved, with him I'm well pleased. And then after that, Jesus goes into the wilderness. So the wilderness is kind of part two of the baptism story. And while he's there, he fasts for 40 days and he receives three different temptations. It's interesting for me, if I look at these temptations, I think each one corresponds to one of the quadrants we've been talking about. The first one, to me, corresponds to the quadrant of suffering. The tempter says, turn these stones into bread. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to be hungry. Just use your power. Take care of your needs. What's the big deal? And on the face of it, what is the big deal? I mean, why can't Jesus just do that? He's not hurting anyone. But Jesus recognizes there's a temptation here, and that temptation is comfort. Everyone say that word, comfort prioritizing his own needs over the needs of others. Take care of myself first. Use my power to, to cover up my authority. He recognizes that is a false path, and so he resp responds to the tempter and says, man shall not live by bread alone, but only by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. He rejects the first temptation of comfort. Then comes the, the next temptation, the tempter takes him up to the pinnacle, some mountaintop where he can see all the kingdoms of the world laid before him. And Satan says, all the kingdoms of the world I will give you if you just bow down and worship me. Now, on one hand, you know, Satan, he's pulled off his gloves at this point. He, the idolatry is laid bare. You have to lay down, you have to kneel down and worship me to receive this. But that doesn't make the temptation any less powerful. Because what Satan is really offering Jesus is control. Say that with me, control. Control the world. Wouldn't it be easier, Jesus, if you could just be in control of everything? Wouldn't it be easier to control the nations? If you could control the hearts of every person, you could take care of hunger, you could take care of war, you could just wipe it all out. But Jesus knows this is a false path. Control is false. Authority without vulnerability doesn't exist. And he's not gonna force our obedience and our love. Instead, Jesus offers his obedience 
and his love and his faithfulness to his father. So then comes the third temptation. Satan takes Jesus to Jerusalem to the pinnacle of the temple. There would have been crowds gathered there to worship, to offer their morning sacrifices. And and Satan says to Jesus, cast yourself down because isn't it written that he'll give his angels charge over you, that they'll bear you up on their wings so your feet won't even touch a stone. In other words, you say you trust in God, prove it. Now what's the temptation here? To me, it's interesting because, as I said, these stories appear in both Matthew and Luke's gospel, but they do them in different order, right? In in Matthew's gospel, it starts with the bread, then the temple, then all the kings of the world. And that used to make more sense to me because wouldn't the pinnacle of all temptation be, I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of the world, ultimate control. Wouldn't Wouldn't that be the most tempting option? But in Luke's gospel, this is the third temptation. And what is, it, what is the temptation about? I think what Satan is tempting Jesus with is safety. Throw yourself down, and his angels will keep you from, from even hurting your foot. You'll be safe. It's the location that's really important, because Satan takes Jesus to, to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the site where Jesus will be killed, Throughout Luke's gospel, it says again and again and again that Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. That was, he knew that when he went to Jerusalem, that was where he was going to face death. That was where he was going to offer his own life. In other words, Satan is saying, you don't have to do that. Just, he'll protect you. God loves you. You won't have to, your foot won't even have to get hurt. This whole sacrifice business, you don't even need to go there. What Satan is offering is safety. Say that word with me, safety. And in Luke's gospel, safety is the most tempting option to Jesus. The reason I think it's the most tempting option is because when Jesus rejects it and says, no, depart from me, Then what does it say about Satan? It says he leaves Jesus until a more opportune time. Scholars believe that more opportune time was when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was so anguished in spirit that he was sweating blood drops, that that was the moment that the tempter returned to say, you don't have to do this. Choose safety. just, Just leave all this sacrifice business behind. And yet Jesus, in that moment, even though he asked his father for the cup to pass from him, he still prayed, not my will, but your will be done. So do you remember the three temptations I said? Comfort, control, safety. Jesus is tempted. Go to the next slide, please. Jesus is tempted to save himself from suffering. Comfort. Jesus is tempted to gain the authority. Why? To control others. And he's tempted to withdraw, to retreat into safety, to give up this task that the Father has given him. And yet Jesus rejects those temptations. He doesn't use his authority or his powers to cover up his vulnerability. Instead, he steps into vulnerability and he offers up his life as an atonement for all the rest of us. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as something to be exploited. See, there's that word, exploited. But instead, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, given him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You see, Jesus ends up with the highest position of authority possible. He is exalted to such a point that someday every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. But how does Jesus get to that place of authority? It's not by lording it over people. It's not by exploiting his position for his own safety. The path to that authority is through great vulnerability, by emptying himself, 
by taking the form of a slave, by being obedient even to the point of death on a cross. It's the path of vulnerability that leads to his authority. How does he do that? I mean, I'm tempted. I'm sure you are too. I'm tempted sometimes to hide my vulnerabilities, to put up a big front and pretend that I have it all together when I really don't. I'm tempted all the time to use my authority to, you know, to, to, to give myself privilege or, or glory, you know. Or, or sometimes the biggest temptation for me is that safety one, that I, it, it's much easier sometimes to withdraw rather than put myself out there and, and take a risk when bold action is required. So how did Jesus see through all these temptations? To me, the answer is in his identity. You see, before the temptations came, there was a moment when he was baptized and the heavens opened up. And what did God speak to Jesus in that moment? You are my son, my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Remember, I said there are differences between Matthew and Luke's gospel. This is one of those differences. If you go to Matthew's gospel, you'll see that the, 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 the pronouns are in third person. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Who is God speaking to in Matthew's gospel? He's speaking to the crowd. Jesus doesn't need to know who he is. The crowd needs to know who he is. So this is my son. It even adds Matthew's gospel, listen to him. But in Luke's gospel and in Mark's gospel, the pronouns are second person. God speaks directly to Jesus. The implication to me is that Jesus needs to know who he is. He needs that identity given and reaffirmed. You are my son, my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. See, the choices we make and the decisions, the temptations we fall to, it it all comes out of our identity. And when we have our identity based in who God says we are, That's a firm identity. We aren't tempted by all the temptations that Satan would put before us. It's when we put our identity in something false. When we place our identity in our job or our title or our position or our wealth or our popularity or our beauty or our abilities, when we put our identity in something else, that's a false identity. That's when we are prone to temptation. But Jesus' identity is grounded in who God says he is. And nothing Satan offers him is worth trading in that identity. It's not worth trading in the identity of being God's son in order to be rich or in order to be powerful, in order to be well-fed. And and the, the, the great thing about the identity is that it's given not just before the temptations. The identity is given before Jesus has done anything Jesus hasn't even preached a sermon yet. He hasn't healed a single person. Yet before Jesus does anything, God says, you're my son, my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The rest of his ministry is living out that identity. One more little detail about the story. Jesus receives this identity, and then he goes into the wilderness. But how long does he stay in the wilderness? 40 days. Now, why 40 Why 40? Well, the easy answer is that 40 matches how long the Israelites were in the wilderness. Except they were in 40 years, not 40 days, right? But but that doesn't really answer the question, why the number 40? Pastor Allen's story, he, he suggests that this number is deeply symbolic. That whenever you see the number 40 in Scripture, it signifies something. And he asked the question, where else do you see 40 in nature? Where is that number significant in the world around us? He says 40 is the number of weeks it takes for a woman to bear a life from conception to birth. And so whenever you see 40 in the Bible, that represents how long it takes for a new identity to move from conception to reality. You see, we're given an identity by God, but just because we're given an identity doesn't mean we instantly accept it. 
See, the identity that God gives us has to seep into our bones. It has to be forged and formed over time. And so the Israelites spend 40 years in the desert. And over those 40 years, they move from being a ragtag bunch of slaves who escaped from Egypt to being God's chosen people who lean on him in all their ways. 40 years for that new identity to take root. And in Jesus' case, 40 days for him to move from being carpenter's son to being Messiah, son of God, son of man, who will honor God in all his ways. If you think of it that way, then then the wilderness isn't just chapter two in the baptism story. The wilderness is an essential part of baptism. The wilderness is the baptism, a baptism by fire, so to speak. Let me put it this way. Baptism is not a singular event. It's however long it takes, and it's whatever you face for you to live and grow into who God has called you to be in order for the identity that was given in that moment to seep down into your bones. You were baptized at some point in your life. You may not even remember it. I was an infant when I was baptized. But in that moment, an identity was claimed for you. An identity was given for you. You were claimed as God's son, as God's daughter. But it takes a lifetime for us to live into that identity for us to become all that God calls us to be. And in that lifetime, we'll face temptations. And sometimes we'll be tempted to hide our vulnerability and choose comfort. And sometimes we'll be tempted to use our authority for our own privilege and glory to exploit or control others. And sometimes we'll be tempted to withdraw and play it safe, and we won't step forward and become all that God created us to be. We all are tempted and fail, but none of that invalidates the identity that has given us when we are baptized. You are still God's son. You are still God's daughter. And he calls you again and again and again. He calls me again and again and again. Bear my image. Be my people. Use your authority that I have given you in order to make the world a better place, in order to create possibilities for flourishing that wouldn't exist without you. Use your vulnerability. Don't hide them. Share them, because in those vulnerabilities, you connect with me and you connect with the world. Bear the vulnerabilities of others, just as my son did. And I truly believe whenever we step into authority, or whenever we share our vulnerabilities, We become more and more and more the people God calls us to be. And in those moments, God sees us, and he says, there you are. There's my son. There's my daughter. I want you to know, with you, I am well pleased. So each week this series, I've been looking for examples, mostly from our church, of people who are living this out, who are showing us what flourishing lives like, who who are embracing their vulnerabilities or using their authority in profound ways. Uh, Today, I want to share with you a story that doesn't come from our church, it comes from our culture. I don't know if any of you watch America's Got Talent. Raise your hand if you're among, hey, that's more than I thought there'd be. I thought it was like my little guilty pleasure that no one else watched. Uh, it, it, It can be a little hokey, this show can be. It can be a little over the top. But if you watched America's Got Talent this year, There was one singular individual that I felt like displayed authority and vulnerability in a way that was just simply profound. Um, This is the story of Cody Lee. Check out this clip and you'll see what I mean. Welcome. Hello. Welcome to America's Got Talent. What's your name? I'm Cody. Hi, Cody. I'm Cody Lee. How old are you? I am 22 years old. Yeah. Who are you, miss? Who are you? I'm mom. Oh, I'm hi, Tina mom. Lee. Hi, hi Tina. Hi. How are you? So what are you going to do here for us today?
I'm gonna sing a song for you on the piano. I love it. <laughs> Tina, tell us a little bit about Cody. Cody is blind and autistic. Oh. Wow. We found out that he loved music really early on. He listened and his eyes just went huge. And he started singing. And that's when I just, I was in tears because that's when I realized, oh my gosh, he's an entertainer. So yeah. through music and performing, he was able to withstand living in this world because when you're autistic, it's really hard mm -hmm. to do what everybody else does. It actually has saved his life playing music. Wow. Aww. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we'd love to hear you. Go for it. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Cody. Come on. in my life and time I sung a lot of songs and I made some bad rhymes I've acted on my life in stages 10,000 people watching yeah and we're alone now and I'm singing this song my life You're a friend of mine But when my life is over Remember we together We're alone now And I'm singing a song to Just the sum of every high and every 
So just to finish the rest of the story, Cody Lee went on to win a million dollars this year uh, for America's Got Talent. Uh, if you didn't watch the whole season, uh, I encourage you to watch his rendition of Bridge Over Troubled Waters. It's one of the most beautiful, profound things I've seen on television in a while. But what made Cody so special wasn't just his vulnerability. His vulnerabilities were profound, but that wasn't what made it special. And it wasn't just his authority, although his talent was immense. It was the way he bore both before us. And so my question for you is how is God asking you to bear his image before others? And bearing his image is both claiming your authority and being real about your vulnerabilities, but, but how is God calling you to be his image bearer? to be his son, to be his daughter. We all fail sometimes, but as the song just said, in those moments we need to be reminded again and again of what God says about us. That when we are lost, we are found. That when we are weak, we are strong. And when we feel like we don't belong, that's when he embraces us and calls us again his child. And when we stand in that identity, Anything is possible.